Welcome to the How to Be Awesome at Your Job podcast, the show where brilliant professionals share how to sharpen the universal skills required to flourish at work. Enjoy more career fun, wins, meaning, and money with your host, Pete Mikaitis. Hello, and thanks for joining us here for episode 560, keeping how to be awesome at your job, part of your day and your life when jobs are feeling a little bit different these days in the midst of stuff. Well, Oscar has got some pro tips here that will be applicable for you here and now and forever when it comes to deep listening and all the benefits that come from doing just that. So you'll learn one, the magic phrases powerful listeners use, two, how to listen expertly for what's not said, and three, a super excellent question to ask the people you disagree with. So if you want to check out the show notes or the transcript or the links to items we've referenced, you can expand your episode notes or description in your podcast app player or visit awesomeatyourjob.com slash ep560. That's EP slash 560. And if you're at awesomeatyourjob.com, check out the gold nuggets, summary wisdom from Oscar and every guest who's gone before him in an email you can read in about two or three minutes, plus a vault of all that summary goodness from every guest ever. Pretty handy. That's called the gold nuggets at awesomeatyourjob.com. Now here is Oscar's story. Oscar Tremboli is an author, host of the Apple award-winning podcast, Deep Listening, and a sought-after keynote speaker. He is passionate about using the gift of listening to bring positive change in homes, workplaces, and cultures around the world. He's a marketing technology industry veteran with over 30 years' experience across general management, sales, marketing, and operations for Microsoft, PeopleSoft, Polycom, Professional Advantage, and Vodafone. Oscar lives in Sydney, Australia with his wife, Jenny, where he helps first-time runners and ocean swimmers conquer their fears and contributes to the cure for cancer as part of Cantu, a cancer research charity. Big thanks to Oscar for sharing his wisdom and big thanks to our sponsors. Check them out. Now, here's Oscar. Oscar, thanks for joining us here on the How to Be Awesome at Your Job podcast. G'day, Peter. I'm really looking forward to listening to your questions today. Oh, I, I'm looking forward to listening to what you have to say. <laughs> well, so we're, we're talking listening, and, and I want to sort of start off with a, a real strong why. Could you give us sort of like the case or a study or an example that uh, reveals really what's at stake when, when we listen well and what can be possible and, and when we don't listen well and, and how we're suffering? 30th of December, Wuhan, China. Dr. Lai has said to a group of his medical professionals, he's an ophthalmologist, that he's worried that the patients he's seeing at the moment have SARS-like symptoms showing, but it's worse. And he publishes that on the local social media app that they use, and that gets seen by the Chinese government. And the next day, he's visited by the Chinese government officials and told to recount what he said and everything he said is wrong, and everybody ignored him. Nobody was listening to him, and as a result, we have the coronavirus that's completely changed the world in 2020. That's one of the costs of not listening. So the cost of not mm -hmm. listening can be quite significant, and in a lot of workplaces, Peter, people whose opinions are different, who may be seen as far out or different, they're ignored, whether it was on... The Deepwater Horizons oil rig in, in 2012 where a whole bunch of people, 11, got killed because engineers weren't listened to, but also the global financial crisis. Dr. Rajan was presenting a paper at Jackson Hole, Wyoming in 2005 and actually predict the way the global financial crisis would play out. But again, he was ignored. He wasn't listened to. Millions of jobs, billions of dollars of savings have all evaporated and they're some of the big costs of not listening. In our workplaces, it creates confusion, it creates chaos, it creates conflict, it creates projects that go over time, it creates lost customers, and it creates great employees who leave because their managers don't pay attention to them. So they're just a couple of the costs of not listening. Wow, Oscar, you are nailing it. <laughs> those, are, those are huge costs. And so we're looking at listening then in a, a pretty broad perspective in terms of not just you and I in a conversation and me absorbing what you're saying, but but the extent to which I am even accepting, uh, adopting, choosing to acknowledge your views as valid, true, and possible. 
Yeah. Listening is the willingness to have your mind changed. Listening is the openness to hear what's unsaid. Uh, listening is making sure you're listening with your head as well as your heart. And I think a lot of us think of listening as one dimensional. We think of it monochrome. We think of it as a very, very simple thing, but listening has got lots of nuance to it. And for many people, one of the exercises we always talk about in our workshops is go and listen to and consume media. It's a podcast, it's a TV show, go and read a blog post from somebody you fiercely disagree with and notice what's happening in your mind while you're fiercely disagreeing with them. Because for a lot of us, we get blocked by our own assumption filters. My daughter-in-law, when she was 21, she's a judo player and judo players have this incredibly high tolerance for pain, Peter in a way I can never understand that you would literally have to choke them before they would stop fighting on the mat. And Jen got hit by a car while she was riding her bike to training and she was completely devastated because she'd spent a lot of money saving for that bike and that bike was a means of transport in an Olympic year. And she literally picked up the bike, put it on her shoulder with a broken ankle, by the way, and went to a local emergency room and was treated by a doctor. And the doctor was confused why Jen brought the bike into the ER because that bike was more important to her than her ankle at that moment. But what I'm curious about right now, Peter, is in your head, describe the doctor. Describe the doctor. Well, <laughs> I guess I was, I was really visualizing the scene of, of your daughter like with the bike and kind mm. of limping. And so I've got <laughs> very little on the doctor. The doctor's, I guess, inquisitive. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, why did you bring your bike? <laughs> yeah, but physically, gender-wise, height, weight, what sort of doctor are you visualizing right now? Well, um, boy, not not much. It was, it was kind of faceless. I just saw mm. more so just sort of like the white robe. But I guess if I were to kind of get more into the the picture, uh, well, I, I kind of see my my buddy, Shout out mm. to Johnny. He's a doctor. Yeah. So it looks like my buddy Johnny, who's in his late 30s. He looks a little bit like the Property Brothers, if, <laughs> if you've ever seen that TV show. That's what I'm picturing. <laughs> yeah. And the doctor that saw Jen was five foot four. All right. An Indian woman. And again, so the point of the story is, yeah, the bike and all of that. But a lot of us go into conversations where we have our own assumptions from our own experience base that filter how we listen and we're not even conscious of these things that are getting in our way when it comes to listening and a lot of that is really initially caused by our internal distractions as well as our external distractions a lot of us have our cell phone going or a laptop or some kind of tablet something like that so we've got all these external distractions but we've also got these internal distractions as well and for a lot of us we don't even know what's happening we just aren't even at that point of consciousness because we're so distracted coming into the conversation. So for most of you listening right now, it's happening now. You're distracted while you're listening to Peter and myself. You might be commuting, you might be preparing a meal, but your mind is wandering in a completely different direction. So I wanted to give a commercial break to the neuroscience of listening, if that's okay, Peter. Then right now, I speak at about 125 words a minute. You're a little quicker, about 150. And if you are auctioning cattle, you're at about 200 words per minute. But you can listen at 400 words per minute. So you fill in the gaps because your mind gets bored and your mind's distracted. So this is the 125-400 rule that says, I speak at 125 words a minute, you listen at 400, and if you don't notice this gap, you're going to drift away. Now, it's okay, I do it myself. I spend all day training people on how to listen. But the big difference between me and anybody else is I know when I'm distracted before you do. So I come back into the conversation much faster. So it's really, really important if you understand the neuroscience of listening that I speak at 125 words a minute, you listen at 400, you're going to get bored and distracted, it's okay, just come back in. And we'll talk about some tips later on about how to notice and what to do about it when you drift away. Well, well, that's intriguing. And I heard another stat about how we can think 
even faster than, than yeah. the 400 words per minute. And, and so, yeah. and I guess when we're thinking, we're not even thinking in sub vocalized words there. No, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Because I've tried that just like with a prayer, like I'm going to think the rosary prayer as fast as I can think the words. And it's quick. It's quicker than I could talk. Yeah. But uh, it's still, yeah, maybe it is around 400, but it, it's not much beyond that. On average, it's 900 words a minute. You think oh, okay. that's so nearly yeah. double your listening speed. Some people can do up to 1600 words a minute think and right down at the other end of the bell curve is about 600. But Welcome to the speaker's problem, and this is why it's critical that everybody understand the most important thing you need to listen to is what's not said. I know it feels like Yoda just stepped on to the podcast. Mm. How, how do you listen to what's not said? But it's really critical. If you understand the neuroscience of speaking, you speak at 125 to 150 words a minute, you've got 900 stuck in your head. That means the likelihood that the first thing that comes out of your mouth is what you mean, that's 11%. One in nine chance that what you say as a speaker is what you mean. Therefore, if you want to have a powerful conversation with somebody, you want to get the next 125 words out and the next 125 words out. And if you can get to about 300 words out of their thoughts, you're probably getting closer to what they mean. And this is another distinction, Peter, when it comes to listening. As a listener, it's not your job to make sense of what they say. It's your job to help them make sense of what they're trying to say. Now, that's a really big difference. And what that means is in most of us, our mind is like a clothes washing machine. You know, we're in wash mode when we're thinking and it's sudsy and it's agitated and it's like the water's dirty and we're, we're moving, but we're not making progress. And the minute the rinse cycle comes on in a washing machine, out flushes all that wonderful clear water. And that's exactly what it's like when you speak. Your mind is wired differently while you speak, while you think, and you make much more sense of what you say by saying it out aloud than saying it inside your own head. So powerful listeners will use these magic phrases. Michael Bungastania did a wonderful job of talking about a couple of these on a last two episodes ago for you. And he talked about the phrase, tell me more, what else, and use silence. These are three powerful techniques. In that moment where you ask somebody what else, something magic happens to the human mind and Peter, tell me if it's happened for you. People will kind of tilt their head. <laughs> They'll breathe out and I'll say, well, actually, you know what we should talk about? Or, Peter, you know what's really important for us right now? Not what we're talking about. I need to talk about this. And for a lot of people, they're out there nodding because it's a real life experience. But most of us just talk to the first thing they say rather than mm -hmm. trying to understand what they really want to mean. And if you're in your role, whether you're a manager or you're working with your manager, making sense of what people mean, not what, what they say, makes work quicker. You work on the important things that have impact, not the transactional things. And listening helps you get to the result in a much quicker way with a much bigger impact. Yeah, that's powerful. And then so then but the points you're making with those numbers associated with the first 125 words in the first minute, there's an 11% chance that that's what I really want to say. You're saying it's so important to not just respond to that and we're off to the races. You've mm. spoken for a minute, therefore I know what we're talking about and I'm going, but rather you know, draw it out for a few more minutes and then we're, we're going to get at the the good stuff and such that, and we save time because we, instead of uh, spending, I'm just going to make up numbers. Instead of spending 15 minutes talking about the thing, that's not the thing hmm. <laughs> we could spend five minutes listening to get the real thing and then, and then go from there. Yeah. And in a lot of modern workplaces, we're dealing with issues that are really complex that don't have just single or binary responses that are possible, you know, whether you're in a creative role or you're in software development or you're in professional consulting, it doesn't matter what profession you're in. If you're in the medical profession right now, there, there, there's so much complexity and multiple and exponential vectors that you're dealing with on a topic. The likelihood that the very first thing that either of you talk about is the result or the possibilities 
whenever you're stuck in these binaries, you know, if you're arguing A versus B or one versus two or red versus blue, the critical thing to ask yourself the question is what's the third possibility and what's the fourth possibility? And that's only going to come about by listening. Gone mm-hmm. are the days where we're just doing tasks that require us to think one step ahead. We, we have to anticipate many things today in, in the imagination economy because we've kind of moved from the information economy to the imagination economy. And our imagination can open up so many more possibilities. And, you know, that's why one of my favourite quotes from Peter Drucker is the, the most important part of communication is listening to what's not said. And, mm-hmm. and if we spent some more time there, the, the confusion, the conflict, the chaos in our workplace would go away. So let's get after a little bit more how one does that effectively. Uh, so there's not jumping at the first minute. There's kind of more encouragement of tell me more and what else. Mm. What are some of the other best practices that can get us to identifying and listening for what's not said? Yeah, I think we have to wind this way back, Peter, and and start at the very foundational part of listening. And you can't listen to anybody else till you listen to yourself. So the very first part of listening is listening to yourself. Most of us turn up to a conversation with a radio station playing in our head that's a completely different frequency to the conversation we're just about to go into. We're going from a meeting to a meeting. We're going from a phone call to a phone call, and we're still processing the last thing that was in our head. So getting ready to listen is more important than actually listening. In our database, we do proprietary research ourselves, 1,410 people who are listeners who have put up their hands and said, help, help, we need help in improving our listening. We've been tracking them for two and a half years. And 86% of them say the thing that gets in the way of listening is not how they're having a conversation with the speaker. 86% of them say what's getting in the way is the distractions before the conversation commences. And some of those distractions are a story that they might have in their head about, oh, well, the last time I had a conversation with Peter, it was really wacky and the conversation Mm. didn't go so well. And what's he going to show up here because he's a really unpredictable character? Or the last time I had a conversation with Peter, it was really dense and detailed and, and I really didn't make sense of it. And you're turning up to that conversation in that posture. And that's your internal distraction, let alone your external distractions. Most people are walking in with electronic devices of some sort, whether it's a phone call, whether it's a meeting, whether it's a team meeting, we're distracted internally and externally. So I would always encourage people to do three things to get ready to get that foundation right when it comes to listening. Step number one, remove the electronic devices. And if that sounds like cold turkey, then put them in flight mode. That's my big request. Just put them in flight mode so you remove the dings, the bings, the buzzes, the beeps, all those notification things that are going to come across your devices. Uh, Tip number two, drink water. Most of us turn up to a conversation with a, with a cup of coffee only, and I, I'm not anti-coffee. I'm not pro-coffee. I, I don't have a position on coffee. Drink water. A hydrated brain is a listening brain or Red Bull. I don't have a position on Red Bull either, Peter. A hydrated brain is a listening brain. Now, why does it matter? The brain is only 5% of the body mass, yet it consumes 26% of the blood sugars. The best way to get your brain operating in a place that's optimal for listening is to drink a glass of water every half an hour. So a hydrated brain is a listen. Is this eight ounces, 16 ounces? How big is this glass of water we drink it every half hour? However big your glass is. Most people don't even drink water, Peter, so I'm not really worried about the size of the glass. I mean, but I'm thinking if you're awake for 16 hours, are we talking about 32 glasses of water? Yeah, so a properly hydrated, high-performing corporate athlete should be drinking about two liters of water a day. Okay. So that's most people go, wow, that's quite a lot of water. But if you're exercising effectively and moving through the day, uh, two liters of water is, is enough. So a standard can of whatever your favorite soda is, is about the size of the glass I'd be thinking about right now for anybody mm-hmm. there. So hydration is really critical because a lot of people say when they concentrate during the process of listening, their brain hurts. They walk out of the conversation, they literally hold their head, and that's got nothing to do with the act of listening. It's got to do with the fact that they're dehydrated. So if we're hydrated, we're going to be in a better position. And the third thing is 
just, it sounds so basic. Take three deep breaths. And I'm not talking yoga pose <sighs> kind of breaths. I'm just saying in through your nose, down the back of your throat, all the way down to the bottom of your diaphragm and then back out through your mouth. And for me, the way I make this practice simple for me, if I'm going to see a client, Peter, when I cross the lobby in a building, I'm going to switch off my phone the minute I cross the lobby, put it in my bag, go into the elevator, put my back against the elevator wall, take three deep breaths, and by the time I come out, I'm going to reception. They offer me refreshments. I always ask for a glass of water for me and the guest. And in that moment, my mind is ready to start to listen. We're going to get on to the techniques of what happens during the dialogue shortly, but it's so critical that we all understand you need to be ready to listen. Most of us aren't. Okay, so some hydration, some deep breaths, and you're sort of prepping the, I'm kind of imagining like painting a wall. It's like there's the prep and then there's the application of the paint. So yeah, you got is important. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or else you're not going to get a great uh, end, end result there. All right, well, well, so let's say we've done that, you know, good news. We're, we're ahead of the game. What do we go forward with uh, in the actual conversation? Yeah, a, a lot of us spend too much time in the first kind of conversation thinking about what we're discussing. And one of the things that sets up a great conversation is how. How we're discussing it? How we're discussing it. You know, what would make a great conversation for us today? By the time we finish, what would you like to do? Now, all the research we've done, Peter, is on the workplace, and I always put this big buy beware announcement, please do not try this at home with your loved ones. They, they'll see right through it. But it's really critical. When I speak, most people come up to me or ask me questions from stage saying, Oscar, how do I get my wife, my husband, mm -hmm. my partner, my loved one to listen to me? And men tend to listen to fix, and women tend to listen to feel. Fix. I'm going to fix this? Yeah. So men are very solution orientated. So a how question is if you come home during the day, like this, this is a thing that transformed my relationship with my wife. In the early days, you'd go, oh, you know, this is what happened in my day. And, I, and I'd go, oh, yeah. And have, did you try this? And she's like, she would get so furious because I was trying to fix it. She just wanted to be listened to. And what I do now is I simply say, you know, is this a conversation where you want me to listen or is this a conversation where you want some <laughs> suggestions? And 99 times out of a 100, it's just, just listen, you know. But in the odd case, she goes, yeah, I'd like some alternatives. And the same is true in the workplace most of us don't agree up front how the conversation should be orientated. Is it a brainstorming conversation? Is it a conversation where we're looking to make progress? That context is always king, but most of us don't take the time to create the context at the beginning. What would make this a great meeting for you? Mm -hmm. What's an outcome you would like to achieve from this meeting? Then we can actually get into the dialogue and explore the five levels of listening that we can kind of sequence as we go into that conversation around listening for context, listening for content, listening for the unsaid, and ultimately listening for meaning. I would say this, there's a lot of big people out there saying really important things about it's crucial to understand the why. And when it comes to listening, why can feel judgmental when you ask a lot of why-based questions at the beginning of a dialogue where you have low trust or low relationship with somebody. Please be careful, whether it's FBI hostage negotiators I've spoken to or suicide by telephone-based suicide counsellors, why questions are loaded with judgment. And when you ask somebody, so why do you do that at your company? Mm -hmm. You can achieve exactly the same result by simply asking them, how does the approval process work at your organization? As opposed to, oh, why does your company do approvals that way? Same question, <laughs> very different orientation. And I think for a lot of us, what we're not listening to is the actual way we're dialoguing ourselves. And we need to be asking more how and what based questions and a lot less why based questions as well, Peter. All right. You know, it's so funny as you, as you were talking, my phone started buzzing and I was like, what? I've got it on do not disturb, but it was an emergency <laughs> notification about, uh, C19 being closed with the coronavirus. Yeah. Hmm. So anyway, uh, <laughs> I, even, even when I've 
said it to do not disturb. Distractions, interruptions can emerge. But point well taken with that, that the why question puts you on the defensive. It's like, well, you, you, know, you feel like you need to justify it and, and you're more likely to kind of dig into it. So excellent. Well, can you bring us deeper then into these five levels of listening? Well, a lot of us are taught to listen to content level two. So level one is listen to yourself. Level two is listening to the content. And that's interesting. Most of us are listening for words and occasionally body language. But you know, a lot of time we're not listening for state. We're not listening for where people's actual energy is at. And I, I'm not doing that from a woohoo perspective, but I was working with Peter who was complex merger he was undertaking about two and a half years ago. And he he was just going on and on about how frustrating it was, how unfair it was that the, he shouldn't be running the integration. He's, he's the company being acquired. Why are they asking him to do that? And something just shifted in his head and his shoulders moved a little bit more upright. And he just kept going on and on and on and on and on. And I went back and I said, Peter, when, when we were talking about that you did this with your body and he looked at me and he went wow i didn't think you noticed and i said well when you shifted your whole body moved and he said what i did in that moment oscar was i realized <laughs> i was listening to myself and i couldn't stand what i was saying and i made mm -hmm. a decision that i have to take responsibility for the merger and i said so what decision have you made and he said, I'm completely responsible for everything going forward. I said, but you spent the next seven minutes still complaining. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I guess I'm habituated into that right now. <laughs> but for most of us, our heads are buried in a laptop or a cell phone. We wouldn't have even noticed that. So, so looking at somebody from pretty much from the shoulders up is, is really critical when it comes to listening to content. When I talk about listening for context, this is really critical. Most of us don't understand the backstory to any conversation. We turn up like we walk into a movie theater 35 minutes into the movie and we're trying to figure out who are these characters and what's the plot and when they're all laughing, what am I missing out on? And most of us don't take the time to simply say, can we get back to the beginning? When did this all start? And slowly by putting those pieces of the context into place, it's not important for you. Yes, you'll make sense of it, but it's more important for them. So one of the powerful questions that you always want to ask is, when did this start? So for a lot of people, whether you're in sales or professional consulting and all of that, most of the time you'll take a brief but you'll only take the brief at that point in time. Oh, what we're looking to do in the future is X, Y, Z. That's interesting, but what's really important is how did they get there? And if you just take one moment to ask that question, that context will create a beautiful landscape for you guys to dialogue on that makes sense for everybody. You know all the actors in the movie now, and you can make sense and laugh at the punchlines like everybody else does. We've spent a bit of time at level four, talking about what's unsaid and then level five is listening for meaning what's the meaning that they are making from the conversation i was working with a pharmaceutical company about four years ago have you ever walked into a building peter where you you feel the tension dripping out of the elevator duct, mm -hmm. out of the air conditioning ducts it's like there's just this tension in the room so that's the organization I was walking into. I was asked to speak to the people leader community in this organization. And 20 minutes in, I just felt the room. There was this tension. And I turned to the managing director of this manufacturing pharmaceutical plant. And I said, look, with your permission, I'd just like to try something different. And he gave me the most dismissive look and said, well, if you must. <laughs> <laughs> you must. Now, I said, I'd prefer to do it with your permission. <laughs> and he said, I go ahead. And all, all that was going through my head, it was, well, I'm not getting paid for this. And um, mm. I, I said to the room, hey, look, just turn to the person next to you and tell the person next to you what movie's going on in this manufacturing plant right now. And the room explodes into laughter. And they're all chatting away. And the tension's completely broken. And the CEO steps up on stage next to me, puts his hand behind my back and switches off my lapel mic and basically looks me straight in the eye and said, this is not on brief. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mark, 
can't you feel what's going on in this room? He says, I've got no idea what you're talking about. I said, look, just give me five minutes. We're going to bring the room back and we're trying to make sense of what's going on because something's going on here. There's a lot of tension in this room. And if not, just kick me off stage and he goes, all right, look, I'll trust you. And he went back down, sat down. Now, what you've got to imagine, it's like popcorn in the room. Everybody's bouncing off each other. And every time somebody announces what movie is going on, the room explodes into laughter like popcorn in a stove. And the movies they were coming back with was like Die Hard and Titanic and Towering Inferno. You imagine the disaster movie they were talking about it. And what happened next was amazing. That CEO who looked at me with disdain and disgust came up, pointed at me and told me to go and sit down in the chair in the corner. Hmm. And I thought, oh, wow, this is a bit of a moment. Never been told to get off stage. (laughs) He stood up in front of the room and did something that completely changed my perspective on leadership. He stood up and said, I'm really sorry that coming to work feels like a disaster movie for everybody here. We've been trying to solve this problem for three weeks. I need your help. I don't know all the answers. What I've learned today is something that changed my mind. And for the balance of our time together, I'm going to invite Oscar back up on stage to see if he can help us navigate through this issue. And I was stunned in the humility. I was amazed in the eloquence. And the invitation for me to come back was exciting and I simply said to the room who aren't we listening to right now Peter honestly I didn't even know what the issue was all I knew is they thought it was a disaster Mm -hmm. and it was that permission slip to say what movie's going on that helped the room create meaning from what was going on now what they discovered was there was a pipe that a frontline worker had told the business about six months ago that required maintenance, but he was ignored. And in our discussion about who aren't we listening to, they said people on the production line, because these were all fancy pants, Six Sigma, chemical engineers, masters, PhDs, and they were all trying to solve a problem that was seemingly solved within a couple of days, and then it would come back a couple of days later. But it was a 35-year-old line veteran who'd worked on exactly the same line for 35 years who pointed out six months ago this pipe needed maintenance, and he got frustrated because he got shut down and said, we can't afford to slow production down just for that pipe that was costing them tens of millions of dollars in backed up stock because it couldn't get through quality assurance because of impurities there so i think ultimately for all of us every conversation is not going to be a 10 million dollar conversation peter every conversation is not going to be the coronavirus every conversation is not going to be the global financial crisis but if we're going in with a willingness to have our mind changed there'll be less conflict chaos and confusion in our personal lives and in our work lives. And, and that's something worth fighting for. Well, yeah, that's, there's a lot of great stuff there. And, and, I, and I love those particular questions in terms of who aren't we listening to and, and what movie is playing right here. Because then I think that can, you're right, that is like a lighthearted way to get after. Tell the truth. <laughs> What you see, is it a disaster? Is it a romantic comedy? Is it is it office space? Like none of us are really doing anything. Is it up in the air? It's funny because that could spark a lot of things. And, and so I'm curious, and I wanted to ask this at the beginning, but I'm glad you brought it up again. When listening is the willingness to have our minds changed, and you'd say, read something from someone you completely disagree with and mm. notice what's happening in in your brain. Well, so let's say we we do conduct that exercise or we are just talking in real time with a real person (laughs) saying something we wildly disagree with. What's the right way to run our brains, to manage it in terms of is like, Oscar is full of malarkey. That's ridiculous. Uh, Has he ever been to my workplace? (laughs) It's even simpler. We've all got an uncle and aunt at the Thanksgiving table that we know we're going to disagree with. Every year they say the same things and we all think they're crazy and they all think we're crazy too. And simply asking them this question, when did you first form this perspective? When did you first form this opinion? When did you first whatever it is? It will short circuit their mind because their mind is literally on 
a rotating play. It's that list in your music player that just is on repeat over and over and over again. And nothing's going to break that circuitry unless you go, when was the first time that happened to you? So I was I was talking to a family officer. So a family officer works in very large private companies, typically with the founders, and they were very frustrated with the founder around the way they thought about cost control. To say they counted the pennies would be wrong. They want to make sure that we've not only counted the pennies, but we've stored the pennies. That was the kind of description we were getting about this founder. And I simply said to the family officer, go back and ask them when they first formed this opinion. And they went back to the story and explained that in the 50s, there was a rationing in the UK, petrol wasn't easy to find, there was no fresh fruit, and there was this whole story. And the founder in that moment said, times are very different now. And then he smiled and he said, times are very different now, maybe it's time for me to loosen up a bit. And in that moment, that family officer was able to change his mind by going back and asking him the question, when did you first form this perspective? Because in helping people go back in time, they can notice the distance between that event and now. Because a lot of those events that create that play track, Peter, they're very seminal, they're very foundational, they're very emotional, they're in the part of the brain that's in the primitive part of the brain, and they're stored really deeply. And us arguing with somebody about why they're wrong on that topic, you've got about as much chance as flying as a human without a plane as convincing somebody who's got a deep-seated emotional experience that they're wrong. Yet ask them the question, when did they form that opinion? And it will take them back to that moment and give them permission to pull that memory out and choose. They might choose to keep it, but in a lot of times they throw it away and go, hey, you know, times have changed or this situation's different, or maybe we can explore something a little bit more. So when you get frustrated with someone you deeply, deeply disagree with and you're lucky enough to have the opportunity to speak to them, just ask them, when did they first form this perspective? That will help change your perspective, but more importantly, theirs. That's beautiful. Thank you. Well, Oscar, tell me anything else you want to make sure to mention before we shift gears and hear about some of your favorite things. Look, I just always want to reinforce that if you just focus on removing the electronic devices, if you hydrate and drink a glass of water every 30 minutes, and if you breathe deeply, you'll be ready to listen. And when you're ready to listen, you'll be able to make a big impact and impact beyond words. Because for most of us, we're trying desperately to listen to the other person while there's a big, big radio station playing on in our head, Peter. So devices off, drink water take three deep breaths and that'll put you in an awesome position for the conversation. You know, Oscar's about to share his favorite things here and I'd like to share with you one of my favorite things, a great app that's really worthy of deeply listening to. It's my secret weapon for learning new things and getting ahead because it can often really feel hard to find the time to sit down to read and learn more with so much going on. And if you don't have that free time, you might think you can't read or work on personal development, but there's an excellent app that solves this problem, which I highly recommend. It's called Blinkist. Blinkist is really unique. It works on your phone, your tablet, or your web browser, and it takes the best key takeaways, those need-to-know chunks of information from thousands of nonfiction books and then condenses them down into just 15-minute increments that you can read or listen to. Successful people are well-known for reading a lot of books, and Blinkist makes it easier for busy people like us who want to get those main points of a book quickly so you can start using that information right away. And with their audio feature, Blinkist makes it easy to finish a book during your commute, on your lunch break, or while you exercise. 12 million people are using Blinkist. I'm one of them. They've got a huge and growing library from self-help, business, health, to history books. I recently checked out their parenting collection, and they've got a lot of the greats there, so that was handy. Blinkist also has the latest titles from bestseller lists, including some classic nonfiction titles from back in the day that maybe you've meant to read but never quite found the time. I most like using Blinkist when I am listening to a little something that tickles the brain before going to bed instead of watching something because, you know, less blue light easier sleep, and it's just the right length. You know, 15-ish minutes is a nice little transition from I'm awake to I'm sleepy. I'm digging their big selection. They've got classics like the 4-Hour Work Week and uh, Managing Up by our very own podcast guest, Mary Abajay. 
So a nice variety there. With Blinkist, to recap, you get unlimited access to read or listen to a massive library of condensed nonfiction books for one low price. If you go to Blinkist.com slash awesome, you can try it free for a whole seven days and save 25% off your new subscription. That's called Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com slash awesome to start the free seven-day trial and get the 25% off if you want to keep it going when you go to Blinkist.com slash awesome. And now how about a favorite quote, something you find inspiring? Consistently, it would be Peter Drucker's quote around communication is an illusion and the most important thing we uh, don't listen to in communication is what's unsaid. And that kind of triggered a whole bunch of research for me and started the journey for 1,410 people to go, what am I not hearing when it comes to my research around listening? And he passed away about three years ago, but, you know, he was a prolific writer. He was a prolific person who led a lot of corporate thought, and uh, he's somebody who thought about things deeply. And how about a favorite study or experiment or bit of research? My favorite research was where in 1993 in Ottawa, Canada, they discovered the deeper you breathe, the deeper you listen. They had 414 students paired off and they had a little device connected to their fingers to measure their oxygen, their current O2 rate. And what they noticed is the people with a higher O2 rates were having more productive conversations, which was interesting. But what was the most interesting was the most productive conversations, so they were self-rated by, by the students, the most productive conversations, the O2 level was synchronized. So people were literally breathing at the same rate. So that mm. was something for me. That's why I always say to people in one of our listening exercises, hey, how did you go with your breathing? And they always go, oh, yeah, I did the three deep breaths and it was great. And I said, did you notice the breathing of the speaker? And most times they'll say no, but those at a higher level of consciousness might say yes. And they go, I realized I had to slow down the speaker's breathing. And I said, how did you do that? And most people will say, well, I just asked them to slow down. But the really expert role model, great leaders literally just slowed their speaking down, which slowed down the heart rate in the body, which got the oxygen up. So those kinds of studies where you're integrating both the physiology of listening with the actual impact of listening uh, from Canada in 1993, that research to me is just amazing. And how about a favorite book? I'm a big James Clear fanboy at the moment. I've been reading Atomic Habits probably once a month at the moment for the last 14 months. It's a habit itself. <laughs> yeah. And so he's got a quote in there that you, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. I would say James's book is a well put together book, but it's also, I've read a lot in 35 years, it's probably one of the best written nonfiction books I've read. And how about a favorite tool? Something you use to be awesome at your job. It's a really basic one. It's one called Text Expander, Peter. I love it. <laughs> We're our first sponsor, and I use it daily. Oh, uh, I would say eight to 12 times a day, Text Expander is saving me five to 10 minutes a day. And mm -hmm. uh, whether it's uh, a quick common reply to something or just common phrases that I use and things like that. It's just a brilliant tool to kind of automate my brain. I love Text Expander. And how about a favorite habit? My favorite habit is really simple and it's changed dramatically in the in the last three weeks because of what's happening. But on a Wednesday night, I swim or I run. I, I run in winter, I swim in summer. And uh, Saturday morning, I run or I swim. And that's, I don't meditate, but I think running and swimming is my meditation. These physical habits are really important keystone habits to everything else that happens in my life. And is there a particular nugget you share that you're known for and people quote back to you often? Yeah, but it's a quote from Yoda, try not, do or do not, there is no try. And uh, it's something that can either set you free or frustrate you. Because sometimes uh, I work really hard on the wrong things and I have to realize later on that they weren't the right things. And sometimes it's the right thing to do and I just need to try a little harder to break through. And if folks want to learn more or get in touch, where would you point them? Just go to the listeningquiz.com where you can figure out what kind of listening villains get in your way 
and uh, a very personalized three-step plan what to do about it as well at listeningquiz.com. All right. Oscar, it's been a ton of fun. I wish you lots of luck and, and many enjoyable conversations. Thanks for listening. Wow. Oscar brought the goods. I think my favorite bit is that question. When did you first form this perspective? Wow. That, that really opens things up in so many ways. Because one, it brings people back to a time in which they were, were flexible and before they had formed it and uh, allows you to be free to re-examine that context and say, hmm, you know what? Actually, things are different now than they are then. Or, hey, you know what? I was a different person then. And you know, at the time, I was really freaked out about this. It really opens things up and, and just is even just a reminder that there was a time before I had this and therefore it is sensible that not everyone unilaterally 100% of people 100% of the time have this same perspective or else they're an idiot, <laughs> you know? It kind of brings that all the more clear and present and experientially that there's more than one way to view things. But I love this question even just for me. As I'm thinking through some things, I can check out my biases and, and see what kind of experiences have influenced it and said, oh, hey, you know what? Maybe that's not quite as relevant anymore. Or, hmm, you know what? Maybe I should take a closer look at this instead of just letting some heuristics or assumptions or prejudices about certain matters be running the show. So super great way to check yourself. How did you first form this perspective? And to engage in great conversations with others and have some interesting stuff you'd like to deeply listen to. Again, the show notes, the transcript, the links to items we've referenced are at awesomeatyourjob.com slash F560. If you haven't already, I hope you'll push subscribe. You'll catch our next guest. It is Lizette Sutherland. We tracked her down from Amsterdam because she appears to be the world's foremost authority on working remotely. And it seems we might be doing that for more than just a week or two. So we said, let's get her. And we got her. So I'm excited to share her wisdom with you at that time. Until then, peace. Thanks for listening. To get the most out of the show, we recommend two key things. First, check out the extra resources at awesomeatyourjob.com. You can find this episode's transcript and links, as well as the perfect episode for your situation. You can search the full text transcripts of hundreds of episodes or explore episodes tagged by topic and competency covered. Second, subscribe to the podcast and get future episodes automatically. You can subscribe by telling Siri and several other smartphones and speakers, subscribe to the How to Be Awesome at Your Job podcast or by tapping subscribe in your podcast player of choice. If you'd like some extra help figuring out podcasts and how subscriptions work, visit awesomeatyourjob.com slash subscribe for guidance. Hope to catch you on the next episode of How to Be Awesome at Your Job.